Hi, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you. And thank you for joining us for this digital forum co-hosted by Duke University and the Saving Lives of Birth program called the Future of Maternal, Newborn, and Child Health Innovation. My name is Krishna Odaikumar. I'm the director of the Duke Global Health Innovation Center, as well as executive director of Innovations in Healthcare, a nonprofit hosted at Duke University. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to join us today. We are at a critical time for maternal, newborn, and child health, and for global health more broadly. We have many enduring challenges that are unmet and at the same time are facing needs from a growing global pandemic. This forum today brings together leaders from the public and the private sectors, innovators, researchers, and others around the world to present insights from the Saving Lives of Birth program, the findings of the recent program evaluation of its impact over the last nine years, and also discusses the path forward for maternal, newborn, and child health innovation over the next decade. And in all of that, we'll also be considering the implications of the COVID-19 pandemic on maternal, newborn, and child health. Uh, thank you again to all of you for uh, such strong interest in participating in this forum. There will be many ways uh, in which uh, we hope to engage all of you uh, over the next two hours. We'll be focusing on two main discussions um, with many of the leading voices in the field joining us for those. We will spend the first hour or so focused on understanding and celebrating many of the impacts of uh, the work of maternal, newborn, and child health innovation over the past decade, what we should be learning from those experiences. And in the second hour, we'll shift our focus towards looking to the future and what the, uh, what the, the trends and priorities should be as we move forward. Um, we are going to start uh, by uh, going to Megan Majorowski, who's joining us from the Center for Innovation and Impact at USAID. And she's going to get us started by giving us the context uh, for the Saving Lives of Birth Grand Development Challenge than the program aspirations. So, Megan, thank you. It's a pleasure to have you join us, and over to you. Good morning. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Krishna, and uh, thank you so much for all of our guests who are joining us. Uh, as Krishna said, my name is Megan Majorowski, and I am a senior advisor at the Center for Innovation and Impact at USAID. And uh, I am just doing a, a quick overview of uh, our aspirations for the, for the session today. First of all, uh, we want to, to thank Duke, who has uh, just recently completed a overview of an evaluation of the Saving Lives at Birth Partnership. Now, the Saving Lives at Birth Partnership is, is one that uh, takes into account USAID, Grand Challenges Canada, DFID, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, COICA, as well as NORAD. And this partnership has been running since 2011. And uh, we have eight rounds of uh, eight rounds of awards that we have made across 118 unique innovators, and we are very very pleased with our portfolio. Uh, we have asked Duke to do an evaluation to help us better understand uh, how we have run saving lives at birth, the benefit to our innovators, uh, a benefit to the maternal child health. Uh, to, to the maternal child health field, as well as to help us get a basic understanding of the impact our early stage innovators uh, have really begun to have already. One of the things that our partnership is asking is uh, now that the maternal child health innovation ecosystem has changed so considerably, uh, how should we as donors think about contributing? Uh, we will talk a lot about this in the panels, but uh, there is many, many more actors than have ever been in before. Uh, new pathways for innovators, uh, as well as new donors who are interested in uh, interested in the uh, interested in this ecosystem. However, many of the problems uh, still exist that we saw uh, when we began this journey together in 2011. Uh, maternal child health. Uh, mortality uh, is still a major challenge and we expect uh, unfortunately to see some of those numbers uh, get worse during the COVID pandemic. Uh, but we are very, very keen to 
learn from our Duke colleagues some ideas on how we might alter our perspective to support the maternal child health uh, innovation landscape think about the different ways that we can bring in other donors who are interested in this space, continue to nurture innovators both here and in the LMIC countries in which we hope our innovations will really begin to resonate and really help us think about how to uh, block out and measure some of the challenges uh, in terms of understanding what our expectations for impact should be. So uh, I want to thank you again in terms of the partnership uh, for being here and for sharing your time and insights, both certainly during the chat as well as after, and uh, hand this back over to my uh, Duke colleagues for the rest of the presentation. Great. Thank you so much, Megan. And it's fantastic to partner with USAID, Grand Challenges Canada, and all of the Saving Lives at Birth. Grand Challenge partners to, to bring this conversation together uh, with many of those partners joining us today. Uh, I wanna to move us now to hearing directly from uh, innovators working in maternal and newborn health. And uh, to do that uh, this morning, we're, uh, at least in the US this morning, we're joined by uh, two innovators that have been supported by the Sangley Lives of Birth program. Uh, we're gonna be hearing from Atul Narayan, who is at Bempu Health and also from Donna Brzezinski from Little Sparrows Technologies. So I'll ask each of them to spend uh, just a couple of minutes giving us an overview of their work, as well as their experiences and lessons learned over the last few years. So Ratul, we'll start with you and then we'll go to Donna. Welcome and thank you for joining us. Hi, I think you can see me, right? Yes. Great, thanks for the introduction, Krishna. So, uh, hi everyone, my name's uh, Rato, and I'm the founder of uh, Bempu Health. We're a Bangalore-based organization that develops uh, medical innovations for newborns. I thought I'd just briefly tell you a little bit about my story and how uh, SLAD really played an important part in it. So, um, just a little bit about me. I grew up in the US, but uh, I grew up fortunate to travel around the world to India and other developing countries with my dad's job at the World Bank. And so from an early age, I was always motivated to get into the, the impact space. And I was fortunate to get my engineering degrees from Stanford and I worked for Johnson & Johnson in their cardiovascular division for eight years. But then eventually I wanted to um, pursue my dreams of improving health outcomes in the world and I moved to India. And at the time I was thinking about which space I should work in. And I have, obviously have a background in cardiovascular but actually I decided to work in the newborn space, partly because I thought if I can help newborns that impacts a person's life for, for you know, 70, 80 years. But also I was very aware that there was um, a growing uh, interest in the newborn space and also funding, frankly, available to work in that space and build a business that can help uh, millions of lives. So I spent about a year and a half in different hospitals and clinics around India trying to understand firsthand for myself uh, why newborns were dying or facing injury and what could be done about it, um, especially considering uh, what other companies or multinationals were focusing on and where those gaps were. And so I focused in on hypothermia and prevention of hypothermia, which I learned um, from the literature and from my experience could prevent almost uh, up to 50% of deaths, especially for low weight newborns, of which, um, of which there are a significant number in India. And so my team and I came up with the concept of building this tiny bracelet to detect hypothermia um, early in low weight newborns. And at the time, this was just a, a PowerPoint back of the envelope drawing. And we were fortunate then to get uh, to apply for funding from the SLAD feeder program. So we got $100,000 from Grand Challenges Canada, $100,000 from Gates Foundation, which honestly isn't much, um, but we're uh, not to say that it's not, but it was catalytic because with that funding in a year in India, I was able to develop this bracelet and then um, and, and get it on the market. And just to backstep a little bit, the way the bracelet works is uh, you put it on a low weight baby, uh, low, low weight baby's wrist, it monitors the baby's temperature day and night for one full month. Uh, if the baby is um, warm, the bracelet keeps blinking a soft blue light. If the bracelet is, if a baby is cold, the bracelet starts beeping a tune and starts, um, and wakes up the mother and the father, starts blinking a red light, wakes up the mother or the father so they can warm the baby well before hypoglycemia, hypoxia, any injury or death occurs. 
So we built the bracelet with the initial seed funds, got our first sales, and then applied to Slab and won a seed grant for $250,000 to start proving that there was a market for this product. And then eventually when it transitioned to scale award for $2 million that really helped us scale this innovation uh, over the last three years. Um, and so I'm proud to say now that we've reached 30,000 newborns uh, we've sold repeatedly and getting repeat orders from UNICEF and different country offices. Uh, we have nine publications and one uh, independent evaluation from the Center for Disease Control, um, uh, for the Center for Disease Control, which evaluated UNICEF's deployment, a very positive evaluation. And um, we've also cracked accounts with uh, the government of Rajasthan and uh, government of Kerala in India. So, um, Besides the funding and really enabling us to build the product, get a sales team, get on the field, get this out to the babies who need it and start uh, building the evidence around it. Slab also enabled an ecosystem for us, which I think was extremely important. I was coming from cardiovascular from America, living in India, working in newborns and entrepreneurship itself is a lonely experience. And what Slab did was put me in touch with this, not only network of innovators, but also networks of uh, um, subject matter experts um, from USAID, Grand Challenges Canada, Gates, and these uh, individuals and organizations literally got me in front of UNICEF, got me in the conferences where I could uh, meet the people who could see if this could find partners to scale this, find partners for evidence. And so in that way, Slab was a uh, catalytic really from taking that back of the envelope, back of the envelope drawing of a bracelet for babies and then getting it into a reality, uh, helping 30,000 newborns and millions more to come. So that's, that's my story, happy to talk later. Uh, you can reach me at rockel at bempu.com if you have any questions. Fantastic, thank you so much. Again, like many of the, the innovators, I think inspired by a challenge and, and pulling teams together and ingenuity to try to meet that challenge. So great to hear more. Um, love the uh, visual aid as well, and I'm sure we'll get back to a few more questions as we go. Do we have uh, Donna joining us next? Good morning. It's good to see everybody. Um, thank you for inviting me for this. Um, and thank you, Ratul, for introducing the innovator perspective. Um, I think that my story would be a little more emblematic about uh, to describe how innovator stories can come from many different um, disciplines and backgrounds. And so Ratul's uh, story talks about, uh, you know, the, the engineering perspective and the building perspective and then um, extending out to find clinical and subject matter expertise. My story is that I'm a pediatrician and a newborn intensive care specialist and uh, was the director of a small NICU and had a twins with jaundice with hyperbilirubinemia and I only had one piece of equipment in this small hospital to treat that ba those babies. Um, and it took a bit of scrambling to actually be able to keep the babies together in the same hospital, not have to transfer one. And I definitely didn't want to transfer the baby away from the mom while she was recovering from her C-section. Um, but that one incident of having, at least for a short time, a concern about lack of medical equipment led to my personal exploration of this problem of neonatal jaundice um, as it affects people in much uh, lower income areas of the world um, with higher incidence of jaundice and less resources. And I found out that more than 100,000 babies die every year from something that's curable with light therapy. Um, so I started my personal journey to figure out how I could solve that problem. And there are you know, lots of people in that space already um, looking to build capacity in low and middle income country hospitals. Um, but my approach ended up being a little bit different, um, putting on my clinical hat, realizing that most of the cases of jaundice are really coming from areas outside urban centers and that the morbidity mortality um, often occurs because there's a delay in uh, diagnosis and then a delay into actually getting to care. And so many of those babies never even make it to the urban centers. And so for this particular problem, you really need to have a two-pronged or multi-pronged approach. You need to both build capacity in hospitals, but you need to have a way to decentralize care. Um, and so what we have invented is an ultra-portable phototherapy device that delivers high intensity therapy, but can decentralized care be put into um, very rural areas, areas without uh, reliable line power. It can run off of a car battery for more than a day uh, and treat babies who would not have um, the ability to be 
transported to an urban center because lack of there's actually lack of transportation or um, uh, it's just too far away or there's too many uh, you know complications just socially in, in getting them there. Um, the slab program was had started right around the time that this had you know that I began to work on this project. Um, and it took me two tries to actually get to the first DevX I was at, which was in 2012. Um, but e e and I didn't get funding that year. I didn't get funding until 2014. So it took me four tries to, um, to get funding. But each of those uh, applications and experiences afforded me with feedback to help refine my idea. So even when you're not successful at the beginning with a program like this, you have a panel of experts who are giving you feedback and really helping you to mature your idea to a point where you can then, uh, you know, take funding and use it in a way that's going to, you know, ca catapult you into the next level. And that's exactly what happened in 2014. We got a seed grant to do human center design studies in India to really understand. We had you know, we had uh, been able to really work through the basics of what the engineering aspects of the device were, but we really wanted to make sure that we got uh, the delivery of the device and understand understood the um, operational challenges of deploying device in more rural areas. And SLAB was transformative for us for that. Um, beyond that, um, you know, I will echo what Rathul said is that, you know, aside from the funding, SLAB afforded us with a network of experts that we would not have had uh, access to, and that was transformative. And the third thing that SLAB has continued to do for us is um, you know, help us move from an innovation to a business. And there, are, there have been affiliated programs through VentureWell and Duke um, that have brought in uh, business experts who've really um, helped teach people like me who don't have a background in business, some fundamentals on how to think about building uh, an organization around an innovation in order to be able to deploy it. Um, in the context of all that, our story is that we uh, certainly recognize that decentralizing care for this particular problem um, had uh, value to add in developed country markets as well. And so we ended up, uh, our business structure is a, um, is a for-profit social enterprise uh, with a presence in the U.S. And we've actually this week just started to launch our U.S. product, which received FDA clearance last fall. Um, it just so happens in the blush of the pandemic that I think we can begin to recognize the importance of thinking globally. Um, when you stress test the system, the healthcare system in the US and you realize that parents don't wanna bring their babies back to the hospital or that um, you know, on the other end with adult care that uh, you know, adults who can be cared for at home via telemedicine um, and stay out of hospitals to stay safe is a smart way to practice medicine right now. Um, innovations that have been created for decentralizing care with a global, global health perspective actually add a tremendous amount of value in a developed country when we have um, an overlying challenge like a pandemic. Um, so I can't emphasize enough, not the, just not only the importance of being able to innovate for global health, but the idea that global health is actually indeed global and it's not a, um, a moniker for income level of a country. It's really uh, a term that we should use to realize what is the best way to deliver care affordably, effectively, and to reach the most people regardless of where they are. Um, so, as I said, we're about to, uh, we're in the process of launching our product in the US. Um, we are uh, also very interested in continuing to work toward launch in low and middle income countries as well, where this, this particular innovation is, um, has already been validated. We've treated uh, well over 400 babies in areas that wouldn't have had access to this care. Um, but, you know, we, we haven't put the ball over the goal line yet. And a lot of that, I think, has to do with um, the ecosystem for continuing to help innovators um, turn their projects into businesses and find uh, ways to work within economies and get funding 
uh, to be able to uh, scale and sustain uh, sustain their projects. So with that, um, I, you know, I'll, I'll stop. I'd be happy to take questions offline after, and you can reach me at Donna at littlesparrowstech.com. Thanks. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Donna, for providing that perspective and congratulations on the, <clears throat> on the amazing progress you continue to make as well. So I want to move this conversation next, um, having heard from uh, the innovators to the organizations that are uh, partnering with SLAB to help support innovations to, to go to scale. And you heard from Donna and Rutul, uh, everything that it takes, not just an idea, but an organization, a team, understanding of markets. Uh, and so uh, it's a pleasure to welcome Laura Sampath from VentureWell, um, who has been leading VentureWell's efforts since 2012 to partner with the Saving Lives at Birth program to provide scaling and other support. And it's been my great pleasure to partner with Laura and VentureWell over the last two and a half years to lead the Accelerating Saving Lives at Birth program. Uh, also joining us for this conversation is Patricia Odero, our Regional Director for Africa, who is based in Nairobi to provide uh, perspective in terms of supporting innovators, especially uh, based in Kenya and uh, more deeply in an LMIC or low and middle income country context. So. Laura and Patricia, thank you both. Uh, pleasure to have you join us. And over to you to give us perspectives and learnings from uh, the last decade of supporting maternal, newborn, and child health innovation. Yeah, thank you, Krishna. Um, yeah, so as Krishna mentioned, uh, my name is Patricia Odero, and uh, on the Accelerating Saving Lives at Bath team, I was part of the engagement management team. And so, yeah, um, over to you, Laura. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Laura Sampath. I'm the Vice President for Programs at VentureWell. Um, and for those of you who don't know, VentureWell is uh, on a mission to support early stage science and technology innovators to bring inventions out of the lab and into the market. Um, and I actually joined VentureWell in 2012, as Krishna mentioned, in order to build the Saving Lives at Birth Accelerator. So I've, um, as Krishna mentioned, had the privilege of working alongside this community for about eight years. So um, it's great to see all the participation in today's call and um, I look forward to the, next, to the next eight years when we continue to work together. So I thought I would take a couple of minutes just to talk a little bit about, um, as Christian just mentioned, the non-financial support. And one of the things that we saw in the um, recent report published the Evaluating Saving Lives at Birth report as well as things that we've heard over the, over the, the decade almost of the program is that one of the key differentiators of the Saving Lives at Birth Grand Challenge is the early investment in non-financial support. Um, so from the start of the program, the founders understood that innovators comprised, you know, especially in the early days of the approach or of the portfolio strategy, um, really comprised, or, you know, largely of researchers based in universities or in research institutes, um, and that they would be needing non-financial support to ensure the breakthrough, that their breakthrough technologies were paired with actionable go-to-market strategies. Um, as we learned in the reports, for those of you who had the opportunity to review it, innovators highly value this support. They highly value the, um, the fact that not only grant funding came in, but also access to the program officers, um, you know, whether it's be at the USAID level or at the Grand Challenges Canada um, program, um, but also through the, through the accelerator, um, accelerating saving lives of birth and the accelerator program. So, you know, the accelerator uh, was designed or the accelerating saving lives of birth program was designed um, fairly non-traditionally. If you think about a traditional accelerator program, this was a different group. Um, it's a different kind of a cohort. It's very early in the lab to, in their lab to market trajectory, again, for the most part. And there was often um, a real disconnect between sort of where they, where an innovator might believe and understand their innovation to have the greatest impact and their true understanding of their target market. Um, and because, so because we were designing for a non-traditional cohort, we customized our innovator assessment framework as a way to assess, support, and monitor the teams. And then, um, you know, that's effectively meeting them where they are. That was our, our goal as a team. Um, so the approach was threefold. Um, first, we assessed each team looking at their stage of development along four dimensions. So team, innovation, the business model, and the market. Once we sort of had a sense of where each of the um, innovator teams were, we utilized the framework to better understand gaps and strategic priorities at the team level and systematically support you know, the, that early and diverse um, cohort in that way. 
Um, and then, as Patricia mentioned, through our engagement managers, we looked for themes that could be addressed through small group cohort interactions, peer to peer learning, targeted one to one, you know, business advising and mentorship. Um, and then the information that got, was gathered through this approach was used to inform the in person accelerator workshop curriculum, the development exchange. You know, many of you, the innovators on this call, I know have had the opportunity to engage in some of these programs. Um, and as well as the iteration of the program design over time. So we thought we might take a couple of minutes just to sort of talk about the four different dimensions quickly, name some lessons learned, um, and then that will set up the framework for some of the further conversation throughout the morning. So Patricia is going to talk about two of the dimensions, the market and the team. For the market, I think, as uh, Laura said, um, the teams were staged in um, sort of three different stages. For the earlier stage, we essentially were supporting teams to be able to understand the healthcare value chain in the target markets um, that they thought their solution fitted with and how to align with customer demand in that market. And then later on, um, you know, in the further stages, as teams continue to work through validating their assumptions, um, they tested the product in those target markets, understood the policy and regulatory landscape, as well as who the key stakeholders were. And then finally, um, the later the later stage teams, what we would call stage three, were essentially seeking to sharpen their go-to-market strategy, as well as identifying new markets um, to scale and grow their product. And so one of the key lessons I think around this dimension is really that as teams work through their product market fit, a key ingredient for their success was being able to very rapidly gain a nuanced understanding of the market dynamics in order to find uh, suitable entry points for their product within the healthcare pathway. And um, being able to have local partnerships and networks was essential for this, you know, um, accelerating this uh, rapid um, growth uh, learning curve. Then the second dimension we supported teams on um, or innovators on was building a team. And so because we know that every innovation um, requires a team to be able to push it forward. And so at the earlier stages, it was this essentially for the core innovator or the founder to be able to identify what complementary skill sets do they need to advance the innovation um, helping them figure out, you know, how to get those skill sets, sometimes, um, you know, through advisors at the early stage and later on, you know, through, um, you know, setting up an organizational structure and recruiting their first team members. And then at the later stage, it was really around, um, you know, strengthening the organizational structure to scale. So how do you make sure that you are um, you have a structure that allows you to rapidly onboard new team members, um, have a level of governance that um, holds you accountable, even, for example, as you receive new resources. And so the biggest learning in this area was um, that innovators use different strategies um, to especially set up in um, markets. So for some, it was um, establishing a team, um, you know, boots on the ground, while for others, it was really leveraging partnerships. And, um, you know, depending on the innovation, um, whether it's a service or a product, um, there was, you know, those variable success in this. And I think we've, um, you know, the end of program report for the Accelerating Saving Lives at Bath program has some insights on this. Yeah, back to you, Laura. Great, thanks. So yeah, and, and um, speaking of innovation, one of the other realizations early on was while the portfolio um, swayed a little bit more heavily toward products and, and um, devices, we understood that we needed to be able to differentiate between innovators that were working on um, you know, a, a widget or a device that was going to be hitting the market and those that were working on services and approaches um, and, and innovations that were um, holistic, you know, a little bit more um, um, service oriented. So um, we divided or sort of separated out those two pieces. And when we looked at key milestones around um, the innovation, um, you know, we wanted to make sure that we were focusing on that earlier stage around the functional prototype or the conceptual framework. We wanted to see that uh, innovators had an MVP or minimum viable product. And for the products, we were starting to look at, um, you know, what their um, IP pathway might look like. So have they filed an inventor's disclosure? What kinds of, um, what kinds of uh, patent pathways were they anticipating their technology to travel through? As teams moved through, um, we started to see more of a refinement of their products or their service based off of their development of their value proposition, 
We wanted to make sure we were seeing in situ pilots being conducted and Ratu mentions, both Ratu and Donna mentioned how the program was supporting them through some of these, through some of these stages. Um, and again, for products, um, we started to, we wanted to make sure we saw some very clear understanding that, that the innovators understood their patent, um, sort of where they were with their patent filing and where it was applicable, depending on the target market, where they were planning to launch, et cetera. And then as teams moved into the latest stages, um, you know, what were their manufacturing plans? Um, how were they planning to, to manufacture at scale? Did they have sales and distribution contracts um, in their target market where they were planning to be, where they would be launching? Do they have appropriate regulatory approvals? Um, and, and are they tracking uh, um, relevant metrics for impact? And, and that's relevant regardless of whether you're talking about a product or a service. Um, you know, in terms of lesson learned for this domain, I think this portfolio is largely comprised of innovators that are, um, this is the reason that they're, they came into the Saving Lives at Birth program. So we often think about the innovations as being the babies. Um, I know that both Donna and Ratul would say that about, about their devices. Um, you know, so innovators generally are most comfortable working on their product or their service. And yet we found that it was critical to push them beyond the widget or beyond that approach to um, and make sure that they were thinking more holistically across the, the sort of um, the arc of what they needed to be uh, the strategy for, for impact. And which brings me to the business model. Um, and Donna, thank you for sort of that uh, prompt there around your talking about the importance of, of the accelerator, um, helping you understand more of the business um, mindset. So uh, as we looked at business model, at the earliest stages, again, key milestones there are just are the very early identification and articulation of a value proposition. You know, have innovators completed a competitive landscape analysis in the target market? Do they understand enough of who the current players are? And are they starting to think about what their own pathway to scale will look like? Are they building a venture around this technology or the service? Um, are they going to be licensing? Are they going to be trying to look for partnerships for distribution? So for as teams moved through the, the stages, um, you know, they became um, much more focused on validation of their business model, um, understanding more appropriate financial models, conducting market trials. And again, as, as um, companies became more advanced, they were starting to, um, you know, have sales, seek extra, you know, alternative forms of, of funding, um, and then making sure that they validated their unit economics and really building their company out. So, Again, in terms of lessons, unlike the innovation, um, this area is where innovators are often least comfortable. Uh, so in the words of Michael Free, you know, he, he, he nailed it when he said, you know, too often innovators are locked in the dungeon of their discipline. Uh, and this is something that I think Donna spoke to as well. So really the business model was an area that we as a team needed to push innovators. It's the wraparound for the successful launch and strategy. Uh, for impact and the critical work that we did as a team was to really um, help innovators understand that there there was a, a more holistic approach to ensuring that their innovations uh, hit the market and, and hit the impact that they were committed to to reaching. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Patricia to for the last couple couple thoughts. Yeah, thank you, Laura. I think as Laura mentioned, um, you know, this was a very tailored approach um, that tried to provide, um, you know, multiple touch points for innovators. And while it did take a while to kind of finesse and get right, um, we believe that um, you know, teams that participate in the program were able to really see a tangible value add. You know, 93% of our innovators reported that the program was able to help them achieve organizational milestones. And a similar number also said that they credit the program uh, to contributing towards the sustainability and the scale of their innovation. And so that's, I think, one big takeaway from this. Um, I think another interesting aspect of, um, of this is really essentially that um, these multiple touch points, and I think Ratul said this, um, allowed innovators to stay engaged with the program because there was different people that innovators were able to draw from, you know, from their peers, from uh, mentors, um, from the engagement team, from our implementing partners, who are partners that supported us um, with very specific projects um, around you know, different challenges that the teams are facing. And so I think this is also another key takeaway, you know, having a program that um, provides you know, multiple touch points that allow innovators to stay engaged 
um, you know, even as they face the hurdles of, you know, scaling, growing and scaling an MNCH innovation. Yeah, so that's, I think, essentially what um, our key sort of top line messages are. Yeah, thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Patricia and Laura. Uh, you know, it's tough to, to put eight years of support of a, of a major program into 10 minutes of conversation, but I think you gave us a very nice flavor of, of where the innovators are in this program and more broadly how that translates to the needs of innovators really trying to bring um, early to, to mid-stage innovation to life and, and get it to people whose lives and health can be improved. So thank you both. I wanna uh, take us for one more very deep perspective, which is on um, uh, findings from an evaluation um, that uh, our Duke University team and colleagues were able to undertake over the last two and a half years, focused very specifically on the Saving Lives of Birth program. And to review that for us, uh, joining us is uh, Joy Noel Baumgartner, who is a faculty member at Duke University and also leads the Global Health Institute Evidence Lab. So Joy Noel, thank you again for uh, joining us today. And over to you to tell us a bit more about the evaluation and key findings of the SLAB program. Great, thank you, Krishna. Um, as Krishna mentioned, um, I'm faculty at the Duke Global Health Institute and director of the Evidence Lab, which works on uh, impact evaluations for a range of programs, services, uh, and technologies um, that are trying to understand their, their health impact, uh, including quality of care. Um, so let me just give you a broad overview of what I'm gonna try to cover really briefly in less than 10 minutes. Um, so the Evaluating SLAB program um, has been going on since 2018. I'm going to talk just briefly about the design and the, um, the methods that we used, a synthesis of some of the findings that you can find in the really large evaluation report, which I hope some of you will dive, um, dive into, and then some of the key recommendations that we have for SLAB and or similar types of programs that are trying to support maternal and child health uh, innovations in the future, because I think that'll help stimulate the conversation. So just as a big picture recap, so SLAB has funded um, 147 total awards, and that uh, reflects 116 unique innovations. Uh, the evaluation started in January of 2018, um, and we were tasked with trying to better understand how the SLAB program, which is quite broad, um, sourced, supported, and scaled innovations how well it achieved it is, its intended impact, um, and then also to come up with some sort of data-driven recommendations for potential future iterations of the program. Uh, our, our broad mixed methods evaluation had four evaluation questions. How does SLAB map onto the global landscape of maternal and neonatal health innovation? We know that SLAB's not the only sort of player in this space, and they SLAB wanted to understand how it fit into the bigger picture. Um, how does SLAB uh, fill a gap in uh, maternal and neonatal health innovation funding? Again, because it, it's a very large field. And what was SLAB's impact on sourcing, supporting, and scaling innovations um, from its inception in 2011 through 2018? And then finally, what was the impact of the SLAB-funded innovations on um, mortality and sort of the, the maternal and neonatal health ecosystem? So this is really a quite uh, large task for an evaluation. It's um, called a complex evaluation because of the, the diversity of the questions. So we had a diversity of methods. Um, there was a quite deep portfolio analysis and landscape review, lots and lots of documents um, that were generously shared from USAID, Grand Challenges Canada, from the innovators themselves that we reviewed. Um, we conducted over 80 semi-structured interviews with key informants. Um, from innovators, stakeholders, funders, donors, government officials in both high and low income um, settings, a quantitative survey that we administered online to innovators. And let me just thank the innovators that are on the call because I see many of you there. We really appreciate your time doing those surveys and those interviews with us. Um, desk research on sort of the space of philanthropy within maternal and neonatal health. And then we also conducted some cost effectiveness analyses for a subset of the transition to scale grantees. Next slide. All right, so I'm just going to highlight some sort of big picture achievements and then also some what we call areas to strengthen or points of discussion, which I think will be um, interesting for the the future panels to, to dive deeper on. So we sort of organized it in the achievements thinking about sourcing, supporting, and scaling. So under sort of the sourcing area of achievements, um, there was really clear um, 
qualitative and um, quantitative data actually in the, in the survey that SLAB was able to both inspire and fund a large proportion of early stage ideas, um, more so than other funders that are in the same space. And then that's some sort of a, a unique contribution of SLAB. Um, also, the open approach um, to bringing in sort of new players into the field of maternal and neonatal health was, uh, again, something unique about this, the SLAB um, design and the increased awareness of innovation in and of itself within maternal and neonatal health. It's sort of, um, it's got a great name, Saving Lives at Birth, but just the way that it was designed and promoted sort of just lifted the field um, more broadly. Um, in the supporting realm, Ben Sherwell and Patricia and Laura have already talked about like, you know, you, you would win the award, but then you were supported throughout the, the life of the award. And, and that was really important and valuable from the innovators perspective, as well as the donors um, in terms of highlighting the time they spent. It was a, you had that opportunity to get seed funding, it could move on to validation funding, transition to scale funding, and all of that sort of staged um, funding support was beneficial, as well as what they have already mentioned, sort of this idea of um, accelerating their pathway through uh, platforms and more targeted technical assistance. So um, as many of you know, SLAB hosted a development exchange each year in DC. They sort of fostered a community of innovators. They facilitated connections and relationships and partnerships. And again and again, that came out as really important in addition to the more targeted activities of the accelerator itself, which gets us into the scaling part. Um, the capacity building and technical assistance, again, was really important. Um, and the, this provision of non-financial support with the multi-year financial awards. And again, it's not just that they valued it, it was also that it was something unique that SLAB was doing um, compared to some of the other funders in the same space. So those were all sort of the big picture achievements of what really worked well and what made it different from other um, uh, funders and donors within maternal and neonatal health. Areas to strengthen or points of discussion that sort of came out from all of our different methods. Um, sort of a call to increase um, lower and middle income countries key stakeholder leadership in the agenda setting stage. They were certainly there, but there was some feedback that it could be even greater. Um, likewise, strengthening representation of more ELMIC led innovations within the innovation portfolio. So about 83% um, of the awards were given to uh, innovators whose headquarters were based in high income countries. And just thinking more intentionally about what proportion would we um, ideally want to see or do the donors and funders really want to see in terms of that portfolio balance and representation. Um, there were thoughts and feedback about more pro having the program itself, um, because they are such a powerful convening platform <clears throat> to more proactively link with in-country resources for example, within USAID missions, the government um, or the private sector. Again, there was certainly a lot of facilitation of connections, but I think for a lot of the innovators being newer to a business model mindset, it was it was hard work and they and some of some of them actually wanted even more support or opportunities to sort of embed their innovations into larger projects. So for example, if a if USAID had a bilateral in uh, Kenya, for example, that was focused on maternal and child health, would there have been a space to um, more easily embed some of these innovations for, um, for scaling? Can you go back one on the slides? Thanks. Um, Laura touched a little bit on um, the, the business aspect, commercialization, um, this, this handoff of, of transition to scale. Um, while there's a, a, the, the types of funding that you could get were seed validation and transition to scale um, to, to notice that it really was not a full scaled up model for many of these folks yet. They might be working in a region or a smaller geographic area within a country, um, but lots of them had not gone the next step to an even larger scale. Um, although some folks were actually working in multiple countries. Um, 
And then the last piece, which I hope will come up again in discussion, is standardizing sort of the metrics to benchmark the milestones of the slab innovations themselves and at the portfolio level. There was a, a, a tension that sort of showed up in, in different, different points about um, the public sector, um, uh, hold on, the public sector, uh, public health impact, where you might have the most folks that are, are, are impacted by mortality um, versus sort of business sustainability, which sometimes might not align with reaching the most vulnerable. Next slide. So a lot of what I just said is actually on this graphic, um, so I don't need to um, to repeat it, but this is sort of a, a visual sort of pulling it together that there's some more thought that could happen about potentially more targeting and engagement with, um, with local stakeholders on sourcing, scaling and thinking about whether SLAB or other types of programs like SLAB want to go that next step and fund the really large scale uh, section and how they sort of get more element rep representation because that could potentially also help facilitate the handoff transition as well. Um, and I'll end there. So please read the report, I'll throw that in. Great. Thank you so much, Joy Noel, and squeezing a lot of information into the, the 10 minutes there, which is much appreciated. And, uh, and you'll be able to find the full report uh, online as well. And I want to bring back uh, uh, Megan Majorowski from USAID um, to lead that discussion and moderate it for us with some of the folks you've already heard from, as well as other uh, voices from the field and, and thought leaders as well. So really taking a look at uh, what impact we've had in the last decade of supporting maternal, newborn, and child health innovation, and some of the implications to move this work forward. So Megan, and uh, welcome to our whole panel. Thank you so much, Krishna. Uh, so first, before we dive in, I want to thank all the members of the SLAB partnership for their willingness to travel this pathway. Uh, as Joy Noel kind of outlined, when we began this partnership, there wasn't much attention on this topic in the health innovation space, and the ecosystem was not really as well developed. Uh, I also want to thank our innovators, uh, in addition to everything they gave to the report that we hope everyone is going to take the time to read. They really give of themselves, often at the expense of their families, and we remain incredibly grateful for their efforts. Uh, and the impacts that they're having in their local markets and on the MNCH metrics that we're really passionate about. So uh, as the SLAB portfolio is becoming more mature and as this phase of the SLAB partnership is winding down, we're really excited to have access to the great report that the Duke team has created for us. Uh, while I don't really speak on behalf of the SLAB um, or any of the individual partnership members, I can share that we're looking to answer several key questions. We're thinking about how can we best focus on impact at scale, especially within the context that many of our donors have large investments in more conventional MNCH programming. How can we best think about nurturing uh, the innovation ecospace? We know that there's a scaling pathway and for our innovators as they move from more than one country where they might have piloted, we find there's a general disconnect between the supply of global high quality ready or nearly ready for market innovations and the demand from individual countries who have a focus on a specific topic area uh, and they just might not know about all the options that could be deployed in their markets. So among other things, the uh, partnership is looking at how do we focus on supercharging that pathway to scale for our innovators, especially with their integration with or partnership with local governments. And finally, how do we think about fostering efforts to keep bringing in new players, new innovators, scaling partners, and new and different types of funders, uh, including those from the private sector. So to help answer some of those questions, I want to introduce our first panel of uh, the future of MNCH innovation space in light of the evaluation findings. So uh, I'm going to first of all reintroduce to our panel uh, several folks who you've already heard from, uh, which uh, are Laura Sampath, Patricia Odero, and Joy Noel. And then I will ask uh, two new panelists, Krista Donaldson and Renuka, to introduce themselves. Uh, Krista, if you could start us off. Sure. Hi, everybody. Um, it's great to see you virtually. I'm Krista Donaldson. I'm CEO of DREV. DREV is short for Design Revolution, and that gives you a hint at how we do our work. Our focus is to develop uh, 
needed medical devices, um, high quality, I really appreciated that you said that, Megan, high quality, world-class medical devices to address global health needs. Um, just to give you a quick sense of our innovations, we've worked in the newborn jaundice space. We have four products in that line, um, and then also in prosthetics. And then we've, we've started to double down more so in newborn and maternal health. But we have an exciting milestone coming up later this year. We're gonna surpass 1 million patients treated with our devices, almost all in low and middle income countries. So do you want me to go, Megan? Yeah, thank you. So good morning, everyone. My name is Renuka Gade, and I lead global health at BD. BD is a medical technology company. We have devices and diagnostics. Um, and uh, my role at BD is to look at how do you drive access to technologies that have a high relevance in public health and global health, uh, whether that's through public-private partnerships or advancing innovations. And we were uh, proud members or, um, uh, to have participated with some of the SLAB uh, program. But what we really think is interesting this morning is to hear from a variety of people and then to be on this panel, which I have to note is a all women panel, which makes it also interesting. So thank you for having me, Krishna, Megan, and the SLAB team. Look forward to this discussion. Thank you, and uh, thank you to all the uh, participants in the panel. A, a quick warning to our panelists, if you mute yourself, uh, you will be stuck in mute. Um, so just uh, keep that in mind while we chat. Um, Krista, why don't we uh, really uh, ask you to kick things off? You've really been a global health innovation pioneer, really involved since the early days, and, and can spur personally speak to how much has changed over the last decade. Before we ask our panel, what's next for MNCH innovation, perhaps you can set the context. From your perspective, how has the innovation ecospace, innovation ecospace changed? Well, it's changed incredibly. Um, and I, I appreciate you calling me one of the pioneering people. Dira was just getting going when SLAB started. So um, it's, been a, it's been really wonderful to see the changes that have come to our sector. And, and we are in such a different space now than we were before. And again, I really think SLAB has been a major contributor to that. And to paint the scene, when DREV was just getting going, there were very few groups focused on global health innovation. And by that, I really mean trying to understand the problems that are affecting the poorest parts of the world and developing user market-centered solutions that were really gonna solve the problems at scale and sustainably. Um, we have seen, I would say, a 10x in growth in innovators doing work. And sorry about the background noise, if you can hear it. Um, but we're seeing, in the beginning, it was more universities. Now we're seeing um, startups. We're seeing more bigger medical devices involved. We're seeing all different types of actors. I would say also in the early days of SLAB, we were not... The, the structure, at least here in the U.S. and, you know, U.S. Europe was not... Um, recognizing the incredible innovation that was already happening in places like India. And that over the years has has expanded and we are seeing more of that. I think to join a Wells point, we could still see quite a bit more um, support of, of those groups. The other um, big shift that I've seen, which is really exciting as someone with more of a design ethos and user-centered background, is we, see, we saw a shift from lab-based um, invention. So you know, coming up with really cool ideas and innovations in a laboratory setting, um, and then pushing them out into the markets that need them. We're seeing much more like you saw with Ratul, who talked about how he visited all these different hospitals to really understand the needs and then develop solutions for that. So the shift again, more to the user-centered understanding and developing solutions based on that. And that's really exciting because that means we're gonna have more hit rates in terms of successes in solving um, global health. And then the last big change I would say that we that I've seen at least is in the early days, we, we had some engagement from the big medical device companies, ED was early leader. Um, but you know, the big companies have their requirements around profits and other things. And so we've seen more engagement over time to now where there's much more activity in the larger medical device companies who wanna serve low and value market, shall we call them, um, in the long term and major partnerships and major distribution being set up. And that's really exciting because as a global society, we are not going to be able to address these gaps in healthcare if we don't have the big players involved in helping us solve them. Thanks so much. That's a great perspective. Um, why don't we turn to Laura? 
we're asking questions about how to best support MNCH innovations in this changing landscape. However, I know that you agree with me that successful grant challenges aren't just about funding innovators directly. What other non-financial support should we be considering for the future of MNCH innovation support? Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Megan. Great question and great um, things to be thinking about in the future. And I'm thinking about sort of conversations I've had with the innovators over the past eight years, thinking about findings from the um, evaluation report that recently was published, which um, has some fantastic information in it, as Joy Noel was just mentioning. So a few key takeaways uh, from, from my perspective. One is the the community. So um, we know that, uh, as Krista was just mentioning, um, you know, we're pulling in from a broad swath of um, scientific innovators, researchers, um, folks who aren't necessarily steeped in global health, or at least that's where we've we've been thus far. And we also know that when the innovators are able to spend time with one another, um, they're learning from one another. They are, um, you know, not just sort of like commiserating over the challenges, but also um, picking each other's brains around um, sort of uh, <clears throat> opportunities for strategic partnerships, what they're learning from one another, our market forces and, and strategies that have worked in places that they aren't necessarily themselves as uh, deeply invested in. So the um, idea of sort of uh, continuing to focus on a community approach I think is something that the innovators have valued and would continue to value. And that will change over time as we see the field changing and we see hopefully uh, more innovations sort of uh, emerging from and, and um, locally, locally based, which I, I think is one of the other key differences of what we're seeing in the Grand Challenges um, general approaches this, at this point, um, which is a good thing. Um, Connected to that is the sort of peer-to-peer -peer learning opportunities. And, and by this, I mean something that's slight, a little bit more structured than that community building component, but it's, it, it contributes to it. Um, and this is the opportunity for the um, peer learning around the um, key components of innovations and, and launch. And um, structure-wise, we are able to do quite a bit of this in the context of the Accelerating Saving Lives at Birth program. Um, I think that there's more opportunity for that to become even even more um, deeply uh, sort of invested in by the by the uh, program. Um, one of the things I know the innovators are, have shouted loudly from the rooftops for us in the past is facilitation of ties with both private sector and with um, government and sort of strategic partnerships in the markets that they're launching their innovations. I think that um, we should continue to invest in that specific innovation, you know, sort of that facilitation of partnerships. Each of the innovators and the companies and the um, teams that are emerging out of the program have different needs. So to be able to meet that uh, need at the one-to-one -one level, it takes a, a level of investment. Uh, but I think that's sort of a critical, critical space that we need to be recognizing and continuing to invest in. And then lastly, um, I just wanted to speak for a minute about investors. Uh, I know that, um, Again, we hear often from uh, this portfolio that uh, innovators want more investor introductions. And I think that there's sort of a two, two sides to this, right? So um, it's a tricky one, right? So it, oftentimes investors, uh, you know, from the innovator perspective, they're like, give me access, give me access. I wanna meet these people, you know, who are these mysterious investors? From the investor's perspective, they're basically saying, look, I, I got a limited amount of time. Um, I'm not really able to have a deep, you know, sort of conversation in the way that I need to be able to evaluate whether this is something that my, uh, my firm or, or my, my group would be interested in investing in until the innovators are able to articulate what they, what kind of uh, uh, investment they are looking for. So we work with the, with the investors on that. It's, it's not a pitch necessarily. It's more about deep understanding of strategy, business model, and what kinds of, you know, sort of doing some investor discovery so they understand what kinds of things uh, different investors are interested in. So we've been a little hesitant to sort of jump right out and open our Rolodex, you know, whether it's the personal Rolodex, the Rolodex of the larger institution at VentureWell, or, you know, connections throughout the community in order to uh, make sure that innov innovators are ready for those conversations. So. Um, I know that that's sort of a tricky space because there's, there's, there's this mystery or this sort of shroud of mystery around investors and what they're looking for. Um, um, but I think we need to continue to, to tread lightly and tread carefully as, uh, strategically through those, through those connections. 
Thanks, Laura. That really resonates. <laughs> uh, why don't we uh, turn to uh, Patricia? Uh, we, we've talked a little bit um, kind of somewhat academically about grand challenges and the evolving needs of serving our innovators. How has this resonated with your experience of challenges that innovators face, especially those who are nearing scaling and thinking about integrating with government services? Thank you, Megan. Um, I think one of the issues has been around, um, you know, this issue around context and market entry strategies. And so being able to really um, reflect the context of the health system and of the care pathway into the market's entry strategy of the innovation, especially as they seek to, you know, move beyond a pilot into actually, you know, growing. And so one, I think one of the issues has, one of the indicators of success for teams have, has been to the extent to which, um, you know, the team understands the health system context in which they are introducing the innovation and how that care delivery pathway is organized in order then to then really, as Krista said, like um, design, um, you know, or adapt their solution to the realities of, you know, health users as well as practitioners. And I think, um, that has also led to then, um, you know, from sort of like as an intermediary that supports innovators, innovators really asking um, us to leverage our contextual knowledge of a market to help support them, you know, figure out some of these nuances. I think the report the, um, the Joy Noel just um, highlighted also speaks a bit about, you know, something that maybe could be, could help, you know, just, um, you know, a greater focus on building local innovation capacity, because then, um, you know, innovators that are living and based in LMICs probably don't have as long a learning curve or a steeper learning curve around some of this nuance and context. And then the second thing I think um, is essentially really thinking about, you know, um, innovators have to, or are trying to figure out, you know, who are your key stakeholders? What partnerships can support scaling? And I think um, the, the report also calls out, you know, to the need to figure this out early. And within the ACE Lab program, the Accelerating Saving, Saving Lives at Bath program, we also try to help teams, you know, figure out already, you know, do a stakeholder mapping quite early on, so that then, you know, you don't wait until you're ready to, you know, go to market to figure out, okay, so these are the people that I need to be speaking into these are the partnerships that I need to develop because then they're not really authentic and they're not based on trust. And so I think those two things I think are, um, you know, some of the um, key points that would be necessary to be able to help, um, you know, speed that journey from um, market entry, um, adaptation and integration into health systems. Thanks so much, Patricia. Uh, actually, why don't we shift gears a little bit and uh, speak with uh, Joy Noel. One of the major challenges that we've had with Grand Challenges is demonstrating and measuring the impact, at least in our case, of a, of a fairly early stage innovation portfolio. As we look forward, what evidence will be needed to successfully and sustainably scale? What evidence and database should we consider to measure scaling and integration in the health system? Thanks, Megan. Um... Yeah, we spent a lot of time thinking about those questions um, for the evaluation. Um, so one point I think maybe to start off with is um, just a reminder, because I know the donors think about it, but not every early stage innovation is going to scale. Um, there, there is sort of some risk tolerance that happens at the portfolio level, um, and we shouldn't um, to sort of manage expectations for those that are heavily invested in supporting SLAB and programs like SLAB to know that not everything will scale and that that's actually okay uh, because that's what innovations and that's what this space is like. Um, the other thing I wanted to, to, to highlight it relates to what came out a lot in the evaluation in terms of evidence is if you have a portfolio that is heavily skewed towards more early stage validation transition to scale but really not full scale yet you're not going to see the, the big impact realized yet on mortality reductions um, so as you know USAID and GCC spend a lot of time modeling impact um, and spend um, uh, it's a lot of work to, to, to model potential for impact so I think that work absolutely has to um, continue um, but just to remind stakeholders that it might be some years before you actually see um, true reductions in mortality that are going to sort of show up at a global level, which ideally is what we all want, right? We want to see those global reductions in maternal mortality and neonatal mortality. Um, 
so so that said, knowing that that's still the ultimate goal, right, is those reductions in mortality and morbidity, um, having more honest conversations about how to do that and a, a more business focused model and the metrics of sustainability because they're not always compatible. Um, so we, we have folks that might be hitting metrics of, and evidence of being sustainable, um, being able to stay in the market, serving numbers of customers, but then over time maybe slowly, slowly skewing towards middle income um, clients and, and populations because that keeps their innovation funded, keeps their business running, but maybe they're not reaching the most vulnerable anymore. And so we also see innovators that struggle with this. They articulate it all the time. How do they keep that balance and can they do a hybrid model of business sustainability and working in health facilities and populations that can keep the business going and what those metrics are. And then also investing maybe some of their own resources into the, the most rural, the most vulnerable, the highest mortality and, and see if they can actually uh, come up with a balance that's gonna overemphasize the public health impact at the same time. So it's it's tough, but I think those are conversations that, that the innovators are struggling with and they need to be able to talk honestly about how to include those metrics with the donors and the funders. Great, thanks. Um, and I'm looking at our chat, uh, our, our Q&A section, and I know we've had some questions about um, innovators facing uh, competition from, com from uh, companies. So we within SLAB have always looked at uh, large and multinational company partnerships and developing license as options for solutions. Uh, so not necessarily as competitors, but, but as partners, uh, but even as you mentioned, if they have a, a massive organization behind them, it, it really isn't quite that easy. Uh, Becton Dickinson is BD is a global medical technology company. I want to hand over to Renuka. Based on your experiences, can you describe what makes products uh, which have strong public global health impact scale successfully in low and middle income markets? And what lessons do you think could be applied to all innovators, whether from large companies or smaller innovators in this space? Thank you, Megan. And let me start by first saying my compliments to this lab program and its partners who've really taken innovation from multiple sources, from a variety of innovators, um, trying to give them life to save uh, lives of mothers and babies. So really congratulations. Um, and BD has also been one of the recipients of the SLAP program, so I can surely uh, check that as something that was done only because of SLAP. So in the space of global health, at the risk of oversimplifying this, I'll say there are two values of death, right? The first value of death is upstream product development, which is so well um, uh, mobilized by SLAP and its partners, giving an idea a shape, allowing that idea to move from a lab to a prototype, getting ready to go to market, um, working all the way through the clinical trials or uh, data that's needed. So that's kind of the first value of death and a lot of innovations might overcome that first value of death. Then there's that second value of death, which is how do you scale this massively around the world? Because with volume comes in benefits of cost, with volume comes in that numbers that everyone wants to meet. There are metrics in terms of public health, the metrics in terms of the business world, and if you match both, that becomes the shared value, if you will. Um, and so that's the second value of that. Um, so if you look at global health and innovations that have scaled and have been successful, they typically either have both uh, support in the first value of death and second value of death, or typically they take an innovation, no matter from where, largely from companies, I guess, if you look at immunization, HIV or TB, and then they help you overcome that second value of death. The second value of death is not easy, even for a, a multinational company, as you noted, uh, because you are now driving scale. There are benefits in consolidated procurement. Um, there are channels that you have to overcome or you have to establish. Um, and look at immunization, look at HIV, look at uh, TB. The way, the way uh, action was mobilized is by the coming together of donors, funders, creating a mechanism for procurement, ensuring that there is transparency, but a government ownership and support at the same time um, so that product can reach the last mile even 
which is really hard to go if you're going as just one commercial entity and going alone. Um, so that I think is one big lesson that the maternal newborn health community must embrace. Um, it's not enough, like I think I just heard someone say, not all innovations can be successful, which is good, but innovations that have evidence of driving being promising, and I'll take the Odan as a case in point, a slab a product, so to say, uh, where Bidi has given it um, life by making the product manufacturable, improving the design from the original innovator, driving it to clinical testing. The results, are, the clinical studies are still underway, so we can't prematurely celebrate, but the results so far are stunning and um, have a great potential. Um, now, will we be able to cross the second valley of uh, death? To be seen, right? Um, and that's where I would say for maternal newborn health innovations, we've heard other innovators speak as well, having an idea of a portfolio of maternal newborn health innovations that make a big global public health impact, narrowing down those solutions and ensuring that there is a program in place such that these products can reach, whether that's Kansas, whether that's Kenya, uh, wherever the mothers are or the babies are, that it has a seamless um, mechanism so that innovators, companies large and small can actually collectively come together um, to then say, look at the impact that we're having because especially in maternal new one health, and I'll take Odan as a case in point, only 10 to 12% of women delivering um, have the need for an assisted vaginal birth. So it is a small segment of women to begin with and then layer that with the challenges of how decentralized births are. Uh, they can happen in um, small rural remote villages, district posts or district hospitals, and you go all the way to the top tier and then to the developed world. So strategies for the developed world can be can look and feel very different from low middle income countries. And for low middle income countries, there's evidence in global health that you can accomplish scale by actually creating an established program. So one parting comment would be to leverage what's already there, not to try and recreate, but to learn from scale lessons in the other disciplines and drive this portfolio of innovations that SLAB has so nicely pulled together um, to ensure that they actually uh, reach um, people who need them um, and don't die in getting to that second value of death. Thanks so much, Renuka. Uh, I am being told we are, uh, we are pushing our limits of time, so I'm just going to try to do a very quick recap and uh, regret that I won't be able to uh, ask this amazing panel uh, to engage when we did our practice session. I, I think we were well over an hour and, uh, you know, it, a, a lot of amazing points. Um, you know, in, in terms of what we've heard, uh, how can we better foster the, you know, the innovation ecosystem writ large? One of the uh, commenters in the Q&A really flagged uh, a, a need to focus on uh, LMIC-based innovators and how do we think about the capabilities of those local innovators to get to this pathway to scale. Uh, when we think about this pathway to scale, this, this kind of second valley of death, this giant leap to truly scaling, uh, you know, how do we make sure that this interface between uh, deployable ready innovations uh, and actually being able to scale at the country level in multiple countries is, is really a, a, a pathway that we are supercharging. And then finally, as, as kind of was mentioned across a number of the comments, how do we think about um, larger portfolios when not every innovation is going to be successful and how do we much more quickly focus in on those that are, uh, are, are going to be able to travel that pathway. So a lot of great questions uh, and I will uh, just thank my uh, panelists again for their great insights and wish that we could chat more. Maybe we'll have to have another panel uh, to continue the conversation and hope that our next panel will be able to answer some of the, uh, some, some of the uh, address some of the questions that I just raised. Krishna? Great. Thank you so much, Megan, and thank you to all of our esteemed uh, speakers and panelists. I think a fantastic conversation, just starting to unpack some of the really key issues in the field. And I'll say, as uh, Megan has noted as well, this is really the beginning, not the end of this conversation. So much more to come uh, over the next few minutes, but certainly afterward as well. 
We're going to transition, uh, as the panel talked about, some of the key challenges that remain and what the future of innovation and maternal, newborn, and child health may look like. Uh, and it's my pleasure to welcome Tora Lairdahl to this conversation as well. So as we look to the future, we can be grounded in some of the work that Tora and his colleagues are doing. Uh, he has been a, a leader in the field through Lairdahl Global Health, as well as other initiatives. And and part of the uh, challenges we've been talking about are really what's happening in terms of uh, scaling uh, more broadly. And so Tora, I um, wonder if you could uh, tell us a bit more about the Innovation to Scale initiative that you and others have been leading. Great, can you hear me? Yes. Hello everyone. Um, I'm uh, very uh, honored to be asked to uh, tell you a little about the Innovation to Scale initiative. And I hope that Jessica can help me advance some slides. If we can have the first one. Innovation to scale, uh, and I just pushed the next as well, is a uh, initiative taken last year uh, by the global financing facility, UNICEF and LADA Global Health. Next. Like uh, SLAB, it relates to saving lives at birth, but it focuses uh, later in the scale-up process on well-proven concepts, clearly related to national healthcare strategies that could now be scaled up typically to say 25% or more of full national coverage. The full impact potential of a successful innovation to scale pro project will be reached in three steps. Next. First, by the result of the project itself over a three year implementation period. Second, if results in this first phase are sufficiently compelling by subsequent full national coverage in the country of origin. And third, and most important, by setting a strong best practice example that can inspire national scale up also in other countries. Next. Innovation is about impact, and the impact potential may be expressed as a product of the quality relating to the three Ds, discovery, development, and delivery. All factors are required, and if any one of these factors are weak, impact could be severely compromised or not happen at all. And then there would be no innovation. As Michael Srage, the well-known professor at MIT says, Innovation is not what innovators do, it is what the market adopts. The emphasis in this call is on more efficient delivery, which is typically the weakest of the 3Ds and where there is therefore most to be gained. Proposal focused on discovery is considered to be outside the scope of the call and only limited resources should be devoted to further development. That is, the tools required to achieve quality scale-up should already be available. A call for proposal was issued next in March of 2019 for five awards up to $5 million each. 320 proposals were received, and after rigorous evaluation, 16 finalists were selected and invited to submit a more detailed proposal. This went through further evaluation and due diligence, and the winners were announced right before Christmas. The proposal review committee was chaired by the DFF Secretariat and had representatives from the DFF Investors Group, private sector constituency, the DFF Trust Fund Committee, UNICEF, the government of Norway and Ladal Global Health. Next, four criteria were used to score the finalist. Degree of innovation, quality of the proposed execution and evaluation plan, organizational and team capacity, and last, local ownership and sustainability. The vertical axis on the blue rectangle shows the evaluation committee's view on the full impact potential of the proposal. So the higher up, the, the uh, more impact potential. 
The horizontal axis indicates where in the typical three-year phase of innovation to scale that the proposals were considered to be currently. So as you can see, some of the projects were already close to being ready for consideration for national investment cases. And next. And here are the five award winners. Number one and two, the Safer Birth Bundle and the Gradient Health Systems represent further scale up of related projects that have previously been winning both Slab Seed and Transition to Scale awards. Other Slab award winning projects may be part of the bundled Innovation to Scale project. Bundled proje uh, programs rather than single intervention projects become the rule as the projects move towards integration with national health care strategies. Project number three, the Ethiopian KMC project, merits a special comment. Because KMC is more than 30 years old as a concept and would by most people not be considered to be an innovation today. The Innovation to Scale Evaluation Committee disagrees with that position. As previous scale, scale up of KMC has been very modest and KMC is considered to have a particularly high life saving potential. This project leverages impressive results of a Gates funded project in Ethiopia in prior two years. The innovation does not relate to the novelty of KMC as a method by itself, but to an improved approach of integrating KMC and breastfeeding support within the healthcare system. The local commitment is evident by full matching funding to the project by the Ethiopian Ministry of Health, and the project will now be scaled up from a population coverage of 4 million in the previous study to 37 million people. And finally, next in summary, uh, next slide please. In summary, key features of the award-winning projects were clear goals and criteria for measuring impact, strong local ownership, and integration with national health strategies. And next, we are encouraged to see how consistent, how consistent these features are with the recommendations for moving forward in the Duke evaluation report. Thank you. Great, thank you so much for that overview of the thinking and process behind uh, the awards as well as a review of the five uh, awarded programs to date. Fantastic to see different organizations coming together. And as you've noted, the alignment between a lot of the recommendations coming out of the evaluation as well as the path forward that's already happening. I wanna move us now to a discussion uh, with yourself and, and other leaders in the field around the future of maternal, newborn, and child health innovation in the coming decade, now that we've reviewed some of the lessons learned from the last few years. And I want to introduce uh, Deepika Devdas from Grand Challenges Canada, who is going to serve as the moderator for this discussion. So Deepika and all of our discussants and panelists, thank you so much for making time to join, and over to you. Thank you for that, Krishna. Can you hear me? Yes. Excellent. And uh, we will hear more from Tori in this next session as well. Um, to briefly introduce myself, I'm Deepika Devdas from Grand Challenges Canada, Program Officer of the Every Woman, Every Child Innovation Marketplace, uh, an innovation support platform supported by GCC, the Gates Foundation, NORAD, and USAID and within the UN architecture of the Every Woman, Every Child initiative. Um, and the role of this initiative in this ecosystem has been to provide hands-on advisory support to a subset of the most promising MNCH innovations, including some of the slab innovations, uh, together with the ability to navigate the over 150 um, funders and uh, investors in our networks that we have built strong relationships with. So it is through this lens that the session title about changes in the MNCH innovation space in the next decade is very apt 
um, because it is the countdown decade to the SDG 2030 agenda. And we all recognize that business as usual is not going to cut it to reach our goals for maternal, newborn, and child uh, mortality and morbidity indicators. And this is notwithstanding the various unforeseen pressures on MNCH uh, priorities like the current pandemic. So to discuss all of this, we are fortunate to bring together uh, as a panel, the perspectives of the various stakeholders invested in MNCH progress. Uh, I'm going to ask each one of you panelists to please introduce yourselves with your name and organization and to make it less cliched your role in the larger MNCH ecosystem as well. Um, and so in addition to Tore, who you've just heard from, we'll go around this virtual table, starting with Dr. Edward Peter Akwete. Thank you, Deepika. Um, Edward Peter Akwate, I'm the country director for Elizabeth Laser Pediatric Kids Foundation in Uganda, um, EGPAF. Um, I've been working in, in, um, in the field uh, to scale up uh, HIV prevention and treatment programs. And while we have a heavy focus on preventing mother-child transmission of HIV, you know, we've really got to realize that uh, we, can't, we can't do that within a weak maternal and child health um, environment. So uh, we've been working in the innovation space to test out effective programming uh, that's going to help bring good quality maternal and child health services um, in the countries where we work. Uh, thank you. And thank you, Edward. I hope people are finding it okay to hear and hearing. Um, Megan had a hard time hearing, but hopefully people are able to hear. So thank you, Edward. Those are help, helpful. And uh, over to you, Dr. Zolfi Bhatta. Me, I can't unmute myself. Yeah, thank you. So, so thank you very much. And uh, uh, I'm glad I was able to join uh, a, bit, a little late. So firstly, congratulations on getting things to this stage. So um, I think one of the big challenges in the MNCH innovation space, something that we might discuss is really how to get these very interesting and exciting ideas up to scale how to get them truly integrated into the health systems within low and middle income countries. Something that the vast majority of innovations uh, that people work on are unable to do. And therefore, to some extent, a study of exemplars as to what are the exemplary innovations in recent years where uh, there has been true progress, game-changing interventions, and what are the attributes of those approaches that one can emulate when you're looking at different challenges. So I'll start with uh, the challenge of, uh, of tackling birth asphyxia, resuscitating newborn babies. I'm a neonatologist and I can relate to this being a huge challenge even 40 years ago when I started clinical work on this in a low and middle income country where uh, the big challenges and barriers in terms of implementation were not just the fact that these deliveries were taking place in the wrong place, that many of them were in facilities without adequate equipment or staff who were trained, but uh, they were also uh, very uh, hampered or impeded by uh, issues that we had around equipment, uh, technology, training, quality, standards, and I recall that uh, at the level of the agencies, global agencies, normative agencies like WHO, although this was on the radar screen for a very long time, there was very little positive movement in the direction until innovation came along in, in, the, in the face of um, simplifying processes, making them also available at low cost and at scale. And I'm not saying that just because Thor is on the panel, but I think and the, the work that the Laird Alt Foundation has done and, and the American Academy in terms of uh, developing a Helping Babies Breathe program, which frankly became viral. It became viral because it was simple, simple to understand as an innovation in terms of packaging things that we all knew, but had complicated by developing 
complicated protocols and algorithms for handling something which was reasonably basic. I think those were the game changing things. Today, when I look at the global landscape to say how much progress has been made just within the last decade on improving newborn resuscitation at scale in facilities, whether I'm dealing with rural parts of South Asia, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, uh, and what we could not do 30 years ago, the major differences is simplification, innovation around algorithms and training of people and making equipment available that doesn't just die with the, uh, with the passage of time within five or six months. So the bottom line in all of this is that in the technology and innovation pathway, going from concept to proof of principles, to uh, implementation at some reasonable level of effectiveness, and then scale, it's, a, it's not a happenstance. It just doesn't happen by chance. This is a process that needs to be very thoughtful, purposive from the very outset. And some of the barriers that you will get into get to face with any technology or innovation have to be thought out from the very outset. So as a you know, slab and, and grand challenges uh, evaluator and uh, supporter, I, I think looking at the framework of how innovations can be truly evaluated on those standards of cost benefit analysis, feasibility, sustainability, and importantly, fulfilling demand factors that we see on the ground are critically important. So let me stop at that, but those are just some of the preliminary thoughts on how your evaluation work as part of this exercise and what the global landscape shows is also teaching us how not to do, how not to make the mistake, not to make the mistakes that we've made over the last several decades going forward. We still have plenty of challenges around other major killers of newborns, uh, prematurity being a major one, adequate detection and management of infections being a third, and we haven't yet begun tackling many of the morbidities that affect newborns, whether they relate to issues around thermoregulation or hyperbilirubinemia. There are many uh, challenges that lie ahead, but the big three, I think we have now begun to get our teeth into. Thank you. Excellent. That was Dr. Zulfi Bhatta, yeah. whose uh, expertise we have called upon time and time again. Um, thank you for those insights. Um, moving again to through the introductions again, uh, maybe I can ask Dr. Elizabeth Akirapa to briefly introduce herself. Thank you. Um, so my, my name is uh, Elizabeth Akira Pakiracho. I'm a senior lecturer at Makere University School of Public Health, and I'm also a researcher who does quite a bit of work um, related to increasing access to maternal health services. And I'm also particularly interested in seeing these services um, or interventions improve service delivery and improve health outcomes for these particular um, women and newborns. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, next, we have Elena Orly Hodges. Sorry about that delay in my mute button. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me on this panel. My name is Alina Early Hodges. I'm an assistant director of programs at the Duke Global Health Innovation Center. Um, and you know, through our center and being an academic entity, our our vision is a world where innovation improves health for all. And through this, we're to achieve this vision. You know, we're we are you know, fully dedicated and committed to generating evidence on what works um, and what doesn't, um, and so that we can accelerate the, the uptake and, and access to high quality, low cost um, health products and services um, so that um, we can reach those who the most with these interventions. Um, I lead the launch and scale speedom speedometer um, initiative through the Global Health Innovation Center, and this initiative is generating evidence and building a public platform um, to track the latest data um, on what it takes uh, for interventions in the maternal and health uh, in the maternal and health space to 
to move from this proof of concept or ideation phase to regulatory approvals and then ultimately to scale up in, in various populations. So we're tracking not only those pathways that these interventions take to get to people, but also what is the time that it takes for these interventions to ultimately reach people. So um, I think Tori presented a great uh, snapshot of that time frame, but um, you know, we continue to add to that evidence base uh, of the time, but also understanding the key factors uh, that contribute to their launch and scale. So I think it's, uh, Dr. Booth had mentioned you know, the, these key characteristics, these key attributes um, that are so critical to introduction and scale up. And so we're, we're taking a deeper dive into understanding that. Um, the data set will also soon include the saving lives at birth innovations. So this entire um, portfolio of innovations that we've been studying over the last decade or so um, will be included. And so we're excited to build on the evidence um, that has come out of the evaluation reports and the evaluation activities. Um, and just look forward to, to generating um, additional insights from, from all of this great work that everyone's been doing. So thanks again. Excellent. Great to have you. Uh, next up, we have Dr. Marianne Etibet. Over to you, Marianne. Can you hear me? Yeah. Great. Thank you, Deepika, and thank you so much for inviting me to be on this forum. So I'm the lead of Merck for Mothers. Uh, we are Merck's $500 million commitment to helping ensure uh, no woman has to die while giving birth. And one of the ways that we seek to help accelerate this journey from innovation to impact that we've heard so much about this morning is also to innovate in the financing space um, and to bring new and different types of capital, uh, specifically private capital, uh, to help bridge that valley of death uh, so that innovators have access to new types of capital capital to take them to scale and sustainability. Excellent. And on that note, finally, we have uh, John Simon. Uh, thank you, Devika. I had a little problem with the unmute button myself. And, and thanks to Duke for organizing this great conference. I'm John Simon, the managing partner of Total Impact Capital. We're an impact investing firm that focuses on basic human needs and developing impact uh, investment products uh, in partnership with uh, uh, implementers on the ground. In the health space, we work very closely with the Farm Access Foundation and the Medical Credit Fund. And in the MNCH space, we're working as uh, uh, also in partnership with Marianne and Work for Mothers on a, uh, a product uh, to help uh, uh, incentivize uh, uh, journeys through maternity th through something called mom care uh, using digital technology uh, and uh, uh, the safe care standards which are the uh, clinical standards that farm access has developed and also in the recent with the recent COVID crisis we're heavily focused on providing financing to health facilities through the medical credit fund uh, to help them deal with the uh, fall in revenues that's resulted at, through both lockdowns and through people staying away from uh, uh, health facilities. And one effort we're trying to do to create confidence for people to come back to health facilities is creating a, uh, uh, a COVID safe badge, if you will, through safe care that would let patients know that the, the facilities have taken all the best practices to control infections uh, and create a safe environment in, in the, in the, with the current crisis. Thank you, John. Uh, this is clearly a very amazing and uh, comprehensive panel. Thank you all and pleasure to have you all with us today. Um, so let's get started uh, and probably uh, starting with you, Edward, um, with a question on hopefully the short term future, COVID-19. Um, from a local actor's perspective, what have you seen in terms of uh, the effect of COVID-19 on MNCH priorities uh, as well as on government partnerships? Yeah, uh, thank you, Deepika, for that question. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic has led to restrictions on travel, but also on the social interactions, which are critical for uh, healthcare, especially, you know, primary healthcare that the maternal and child health space depends on. Uh, we've also seen a major shift of health system resources to the COVID-19 response. 
uh, that has inevitably led to especially the primary healthcare component of MCH services being deprioritized as more resources are shifted to COVID. And so we, we've, we've also seen uh, case management uh, taking a back seat. Uh, so it's not only just the primary health care services that have taken, uh, uh, have suffered, but then also uh, tertiary, uh, especially secondary and some tertiary care for maternal and child health services. So apart from, so if I may give an example, uh, apart from shortages in basic uh, personal protective supplies, uh, you know, from your basic gloves to face masks, uh, the need for health workers to establish whether clients are safe enough for them to examine, uh, and a counter perception amongst the general public that the health facilities are not safe for them because that's where all the sick people go to, has led to reduced uptake of maternal and child health services. Uh, and we've seen this uh, more especially so at the lower level, small health facilities in the communities. Uh, we've also seen a shift uh, in, in short-term investments in some of the, you know, the low-cost uh, technologies, uh, appliances for community health workers, because all the available money is going in uh, for COVID, the COVID-19 response. Um, and so, so, so that's, that's had a real quick impact uh, on, on, on the services in our experience. And, and we've also seen some health facilities not being available for all but the very ill patients uh, with life-threatening uh, conditions. Um, the, um, the, other, you know, the, the other aspect we're seeing is in terms of the way uh, governments, governments perceive implementing partners like us on the ground. Uh, once there's an emergency, everyone expects express us all to drop what we are doing and chip in, in in terms of helping manage that emergency. So, so while we've been used to, uh, to dealing with public health emergencies uh, of a different kind, uh, you know, more long-term types of emergencies and epidemics, I think COVID-19 has changed that paradigm significantly uh, in, in such a way that it threatens some of the SDGs and other more universal global goals that we've been trying to achieve. Thank you, Edward. Those are helpful but worrying insights, something we will need to factor in as a community going forward. Um, our next uh, question for Elizabeth, as one of our experts in health systems policy and government engagement, what do you feel are the changes that need to be made in MNCH funding as it exists today to ensure government adoption, often a crucial outcome to get to the bottom of the pyramid populations? Okay, um, thank you for, for that question. Um, I think I want to focus on four suggestions and really focusing on um, low and middle income countries as I think about that. One of the things I want to propose is that funders should strive to fund innovations that are aligned with government strategic plans and that address um, country priority local needs, because governments will certainly be interested in finding innovations that are meeting their priority needs. And that therefore means that engagement with the government throughout the process becomes key. But the second thing I'd like to propose is that uh, many governments do not participate a lot um, in these kind of calls when they're there. And so funders could encourage more public-private partnerships during the applications, and this could be done through a range of options that can trigger government interest. One of them perhaps is creating more innovation hubs in, in low-income countries that can expose people to the potential of innovations to improve service delivery or improve outcomes. So this would mean that governments can also put in um, applications in collaboration with the private sector, in collaboration with universities, and this may promote the development of more um, contextually relevant interventions that uh, can easily fit into the care pathway and that could um, possibly be supported by governments later. 
Um, thirdly, I think there should also be more funds dedicated to innovative service delivery approaches. Um, part of um, the results from the slab evaluation showed that just about 16% of the funding was going to service delivery approaches. But we know that many governments, especially in low and middle income countries, struggle with successful delivery of already known interventions. And so trying to fund interventions, um, um, service delivery approaches of these interventions um, that can result in savings with regard to human resource, um, with regard to time, financial resources, while increasing productivity and improving outcomes will also spark and draw more interest from government and could result in continued funding. And um, lastly, I think if more funding to support scaling up can be done in collaboration with governments and can require governments to also contribute to the scale up with um, eventually expecting that the government can take over part of that funding that we may also see more adoption. Um, however, when we think about that, the amount of additional resources that are required um, need to be um, moderate, knowing that many governments are resource constrained, especially in low income settings and have um, a number of competing priorities. So those are some of um, the, the actions that I think um, if, if funders tried to take up within um, the funding space for MNCH could help us see more government adoption of some of these initiatives. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent insights, uh, Dr. Kirapa. Um, moving now to Elena to get the perspective of the main actors uh, deploying innovative solutions who are the innovators. Uh, Alina, from your perspective of uh, innovator support and reflection from this lab report itself, uh, what are some of the biggest takeaways in terms of changes that need to be made and how, how the funders support innovators? Thanks for, for that question and I'll, I'll tie into what Elizabeth just commented um, with regard to, you know, both, both the government perspective and, and thinking of scale up um, and sustainability. But I, I first want to mention that, you know, through our launch and scale speedometer, you know, we continue to collect, um, you know, the evidence for, for what it takes to scale up and the timeframes for those scale ups. And through our research, you know, we've identified that many of these innovations are taking on average between five and 10 years to move from sort of an ideation phase, development phase to, uh, you know, just a proof of concept. So, you know, understanding the effectiveness of the innovation in populations. And so that time frame is really significant. And we recognize that a lot of funding has been going to that earlier stage, you know, to get get innovations and innovators through that first valley of death. Um, so I think that there is, um, you know, we don't, we don't see the impact of these innovations. I think as Joy Noel noted in the earlier panel, we don't see that impact until these innovations are actually scaled um, in, you know, in different countries and, and actually reaching people. So what I would like for funders to focus on is to, you know, continue supporting the entire continuum of, of introduction and scale up from the R&D phase through the scale up phase. So I think we can't forget about the need for funding um, in that scale up component of this work. Um, and then to Elizabeth's point, I think my second comment would be around, um, you know, recognizing that that these innovators and innovations, we need to understand their, their impact and, you know, whether it's from an outcomes perspective or whether it's understanding their cost effectiveness, um, and I think that governments make a lot of their decisions um, and their procurement decisions, their partnership decisions based on, you know, those outcomes and understanding of that impact of these, these innovations. And so if funders could, you know, consider allocating financial support to um, helping innovators, you know, uh, research the impact of their innovations, I think that that will be um, a really important uh, step in the right direction, especially from a scale and sustainability perspective. So governments taking up more of these interventions. Uh, certainly funding could, could also support that scale up phase as well. But, um, uh, you know, I, I think that, that uh, measuring impact is really critical. And then finally, um, I know this is repeating a little bit from earlier, but I really do feel like funders need to be looking at more of those innovations from 
you know, from LMICs. So I think it's really important um, that we're we're addressing and and looking to those innovations that are coming from uh, from local from the local context, and they they really recognize. Uh, the, the local needs and um, and the importance of of designing from that perspective. So um, I think funding going towards supporting more innovators in that space is really important. Um, we've also seen through some of our work that, um, and I think someone mentioned this earlier, but that um, you know we don't need to recreate what's already been what's already been developed in these spaces. So through some of our research, we've been seeing that these. Um, innovations, you know, there's only been slight refinements made um, to some of these innovations that are coming out of the global south, but the, the, um, the high income country um, innovators are the ones being funded, where, you know, maybe the original innovation came from the global south. So um, I just want to, you know, sort of make that my final point, that that's really important. Absolutely. Um, thank you, Alina, and <clears throat> I'm being asked to uh, wrap this up a little quicker, so perhaps moving more quickly to Marianne and maybe focusing, Marianne, on the access to life-saving innovation uh, solutions that uh, Merck focuses on, as well as, uh, you know, the innovative financing piece that you brought up. Are there mechanisms we can use to increase that access? Sure, thank you, Dipika. So just, you know, to quickly share the Merck for Mothers lessons learned as we've tried to bridge public and private financing, uh, you know, to bring more capital to this space and to do, as Alina said, be able to fund that whole continuum. I would say the three lessons we've learned, the first one is simplify, simplify, simplify. Uh, you, when we think about the innovation, it's not just the innovation that has to be simple, it's the innovation plus. The innovation plus deployment, the innovation plus adoption, the innovation plus integration, you know, that D delivery that Tor mentioned, that whole package has to be simple. You know, I don't know any of you, but, you know, when I get an instructions manual of, you know, how to, you know, add some technology to my TV, if it's 10 pages, I don't do it, <laughs> you know? So I, I think that we, we really need to extend that idea of simplification, which is necessary for replication. And that replication, that success of replication is necessary for scale. And that's where you're going to see the return on investment, both the social impact investment, as well as the financial investment. The second point is around data. And I think these innovations need to be linked to data and data systems. And so we're, we're able to understand results in real time. Um, and so that as investors, we're able to understand, uh, you know, um, the, we're able to compare, uh, you know, results across potential investments, not just within maternal health or within health, but between health and other impact sectors. And the third one is focus on the experience of the customer, the woman, the patient. I think when that experience of care is transformative, uh, that's where you're going to see the real sustainability, um, uh, you know, real sustainability come through. Um, and, and that again uh, is where we all want to go uh, when we're thinking about impact. Excellent, thank you, Marianne. And uh, very quickly to our last panelist, John, um, on that financing topic, can you speak to us a little bit about, we hear time and time again about patient capital. Can capital for MNCH really afford to be patient? And what's that going to take from stakeholders? So when you look at the business models that exist in the MCH space, I think that not only uh, uh, can capital afford to be patient, but it's a necessity that it be patient. You don't see a lot of business models that have a very high, quick returning multiple. So basically what you need to do is find capital that is interested in the impact as well as the financial return, uh, sees it as a long-term strategic uh, or social investment, uh, and is willing to take some time to, to, to receive its return. And the good news is that uh, there is a lot of that type of capital out there. It's, it, there. There's a growing pool of money that's looking for strong impact. It's coming from not just uh, uh, high net worth individuals, but also from several institutional investors. And the real constraint is uh, um, implementable, uh, scalable opportunities. And that's really where the focus needs to be on in terms of creating opportunities that deliver impact, delivered in a sustainable way, and can achieve uh, a significant change in, in, in the system. And that's really the focus 
uh, that I think we all have to look at if we're going to mobilize the capital that's that's looking to come into the sector. Excellent. Thank you for that very quick answer there, John. Um, and so I'll, I'll conclude this quickly. Again, apologies for the, the time crunch here, but we've heard from our brilliant panelists for sharing their uh, unique perspectives and helping us chart a way for, the, for MNCH moving forward. Uh, and we can all agree this has certainly been an illuminating discussion. Um, um, over to you, Krishna. Thank you. Thank you so much, Deepika, and all of our esteemed speakers and panelists. Uh, fantastic perspectives, and as always, more information, more um, more possible uh, discussion than time. Uh, so I apologize also for uh, for having to move on uh, in terms of time. We've come to the end of our uh, our session. Uh, what we've heard across uh, the past two hours has really been a recognition that we continue to have many challenges as we work on improving the health and lives of women and children. Uh, we uh, must continue to invest in innovation, but also recognize that adaptation, integration, scale up is critical for impact. And for that to happen, we need partnerships. We need significant buy-in from both the public and private sector actors. The funding has to be appropriate in terms of the, the amount, the type, uh, the timelines. Um, innovators are incredibly important to this uh, to this field, uh, stronger emphasis on local and grassroots innovation is, is something the field can certainly work on uh, moving forward. And we also recognize that uh, money and in innovators is, is not enough. You have to have uh, many different types of non-financial support to be successful. And I think we've heard from many of the speakers, all of this has to be anchored in data and evidence for us to understand what's working, what's not, and to make sure that our investments are as effective and efficient as they can be to move the field forward. Uh, with that, I want to take this opportunity to thank all of our speakers, fantastic, um, uh, every single one of them, and thank you for, uh, for um, supporting this conversation. Thank you for all of the work that you do to support maternal, newborn, and child health innovation. Thanks to all of you, almost 300 registrations we had for this event, um, the, for the interest in participating. Uh, a huge thanks to the team at Duke for organizing the event down to the logistics. Uh, thank you to the Saving Lives of Birth uh, partners for the collaboration on this forum and on the work over the past uh, several years. There is much more to come. This is the beginning, not the end of the conversation continue to follow the, the discussion online. You can use hashtag MNCH Forum 20 to continue to, uh, to post on social media and keep those conversations going. Please do reach out to us with any questions, any comments, any thoughts on how we can collaborate to continue to make progress in the field. So much more to come. Thank you to everyone and have a very good morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you may be in the world.